All right, so thank you all for joining us for today's webinar. This is, of course, the seventh in this eight-part series. It's complementing your in-person training for the Miami Heritage Response Team. These programs are made possible through the generous grant funding support of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, it seems like a while since we held our last session uh, on fundraising, and certainly a lot has happened in those intervening weeks. I hope that you found the topics we've covered previously to be useful as you prepared for and responded to Hurricane Irma. Uh, clearly that storm has altered our schedule a bit. A reminder that we'll be holding our final webinar program on furniture salvage uh, following our in-person meeting next week. Um, so be sure to mark your calendars for that final webinar, which will take place on Wednesday, November 15th at 2 p.m. Um, our original instructor for that program was heavily involved with the response to Hurricane Harvey in Houston. So. Um, we've found a new presenter for that session. Uh, before we begin today's presentation, just a quick refresher of technical notes. On your screen, you'll see several boxes, including one labeled chat on the left-hand side. Uh, you can use the chat box to say hello, ask questions, share any information. Uh, if you post a question in the chat box, you'll receive a response from me. Any questions will be noted, collected, and then I will verbally ask them of our presenter during a break in the presentation. Um, today we also have a web links box, so reminder you can just click on the link to highlight it in blue and then click on the browse to button to visit the site. With that, I'm very pleased to introduce you all to our presenter, Al Barna. Al is the Occupational Health and Safety Officer at the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco, uh, the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, so that's the De Young and the Legion of Honor. His 20 plus years of experience at the Fine Arts Museums has enabled him to develop an award-winning museum safety program recognized by a State of California Division of Occupational Safety and Health, or Cal OSHA, Golden Gate Award. Al is most proud of growing the safety and emergency response program for both, both museums under the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco umbrella as staff and footprint have doubled in size. Al also serves as the museum climate liaison for the city and county of San Francisco's Departmental Climate Action Plan. Al is a trained volunteer with the National Heritage Responders Group and was deployed to New York City and served as the weekly team leader at the FAIC Cultural Recovery Center in the aftermath of Superstorm, Superstorm Sandy in 2012. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Al for his presentation on health and safety after a disaster. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, participating this morning. Uh, this is my first webinar, so I'm really looking forward to it. And first of all, I hope you can all hear me. And today I'll just give Sound you a great. brief overview. Okay, great. Today, uh, here's a brief overview of what we'll be discussing uh, today. We'll talk about the three types of disasters, uh, regional and collection considerations uh, prior to a disaster, uh, the importance of an emergency response plan, uh, safety training that's geared towards an emergency response. We'll also go into detail about personal protective equipment, discuss risk and exposures after disasters, talk a little bit about the global harmonization standard, which uh, you probably are all aware of, and uh, we'll wrap it up by talking about immediate hazards uh, after an, uh, a disaster. Okay, so first slide I want to show you is uh, the type, one of the first type of disaster we'll discuss briefly is natural disasters, uh, things like earthquakes and floods and hurricanes. And in this slide, you see a photo of uh, the aftermath of the San Francisco earthquake and fire in 1906. And superimposed on that is a scan of a journal page that one of our registrars found from the morning of the earthquake in 1906. And I don't know if you can read it. Most of the journal entries uh, discuss the weather for that particular day. Uh, but it says 5.15 AM, Wednesday, April 18, 1906. Terrific earthquake, which demolished the building and destroyed many of the exhibits. Signed, John W. Rogers, curator. Museum closed indefinitely. And the next journal entry that we can find for the De Young Museum was not made until November 10th in 1907. So you can see there, we don't have a lot of records and there are certainly no safety information about what actually happened to the building uh, from, in, from an internal source. And then the next type of disaster is a human-caused disaster. This is a fire that resulted from a, a, a tanker truck explosion. Follow that with accidents, uh, the third type of disaster. Uh, 
this is actually, it might seem a little peculiar, but this is an accident that occurred in front of our De Young, De Young Museum, uh, where uh, Gardner's golf cart collided with the uh, light pole. Uh, it was interesting because the Gardner, uh, it was rainy, warm, rainy morning, his eyeglasses and his windshield fogged up and he drove right into the pole. And you can see the windows on the building itself. Uh, and it just made me think, well, this is just the kind of freak accident that nobody ever plans for. And uh, what would have happened if he had actually come through one of our, gla our large glass windows? It would have played wreaked havoc with our uh, humidity and temperature systems, our climate control. Uh, how would we prepare for something like this? And can you even prepare for something like this? So those are some of the things we'd like to talk about this morning. So the first thing I thought we should talk about are regional considerations. Depending on what part of the country you live in, you are going to be exposed to different types of uh, natural disasters. Uh, for instance, here in California, we have uh, earthquakes. Uh, you can see these fault lines, and these aren't all, but they are some of the fault lines that run through the Bay Area. And uh, basically, that tells us that we can expect and anticipate seismic activity at any time. And fault slippage on uh, a fault line can range anywhere from one inch to more than 10 yards in a severe earthquake. So it's, for us, it's a question of uh, when and not if. We know we're going to have earthquakes. So we try to um, build that into our emergency response system. Uh, again, we have uh, earthquakes in California and on the West Coast in general. And I know you've also had one in Washington, D.C. a few years ago. And you can see historically uh, where earthquakes have occurred in, in the Bay Area and throughout the state of California. And we also have um, 840 miles of coastline here in California. So any earthquake that were to take place under the Pacific Ocean floor would uh, has the potential to create a tsunami. So in planning our emergency response for that kind of event, uh, we look for resources to tell us what the likelihood of uh, tsunami waters reaching the museum would be. And uh, this map was put out, a regional map, Kind of, this is where the museum is located in Golden Gate Park. Our other museum is out here in Lincoln Park. And you can see that uh, we are not theoretically in uh, a tsunami zone. So that's one less worry that we have, although there's, there are uh, other issues that can arise from tsunamis like fires and things like that. And in uh, the um, Florida area, you have to worry about uh, hurricanes, which uh, certainly been on everybody's mind recently. And here is a, a, a chart that shows historically how many hurricanes have hit uh, the, the, the coast down, down near Florida. So you can see, again, it's, it's not a matter of uh, what if, but it's a matter of when we're going to have that type of disaster. We'll talk about collection considerations. You, if you need to consider the type of the nature of your collections when you're developing an emergency response plan. Uh, if you know what your collections are going to need in terms of protection, it's going to be a lot easier to uh, prepare for that and also to do salvage and recovery operations. Again, if you have a, a herpetology collection, that's going to be very different than say, a uh, textile and two-dimensional art collection or three-dimensional objects. Here's a suit of armor. Uh, and another consideration is when you've got objects that are on, on exhibition that are on, on loan, uh, that's going to be something you're going to have to think about. How are you going to protect these objects that are on loan uh, and maintain your credibility with other lending institutions? And something I wanted to talk about is uh, the importance of the emergency response plan because you actually, by law, have to have an emergency response plan. Uh, you, need, you have to have a written and oral emergency response plan that, that must be in writing and kept in the workplace and available to employees for review. However, if you're an employer with 10 or fewer workers, you, you can communicate the plan orally. Some of you might be independent contractors as well, but an emergency response plan uh, is a good resource for how you're going to respond to uh, a disaster after the fact. 
looks like we have trouble with this slide. Like, well, anyway, I can tell you that the keys to an emer effective emergency plan are, uh, first of all, you want a written plan that has management support. Uh, you want to provide staff training and drills based on the plan. Get feedback from all of your stakeholders, and you want to continuously improve the written plan. So some of the elements that should be included in your response plan are as follows. You want to have a means of reporting emergencies. Like who's responsible for contacting uh, first responders? Who calls 911? Is that going to be your security department? Is it going to be your engineering department? That should be determined in advance. Uh, you want to establish your evacuation procedures and your emergency escape route assignments. Uh, you'd also want to have a designated emergency assembly area for all of your staff. And that helps with the next bullet point, which is accountability. You want to know that your people are accounted for. Uh, you want to have people designated for all of your rescue and medical duties that may arise from the emergency. And you should have a list of emergency contacts. Again, people that uh, will provide first response for your institution. Um, at the Fine Arts Museums, we have, um, this is basically what we have in our emergency plan. It's eight sections. Uh, there's the introduction, obviously, uh, staff emergency procedures. That means what we do in the event of an earthquake, uh, fire, a power outage, even uh, things like an active shooter is, is, is incident. Uh, you should have an organized emergency response uh, chart uh, so people know what to do in the situation, even if it's not their actual job. If you happen to be working on a graveyard shift uh, and you're the only people in the building are security people, if you have uh, a, a, an emergency response chart, they can step into any position, at least on, a, on the most basic level, and respond to the emergency. Uh, we also include a whole section on art handling procedures so that people who are not trained as art handlers will have some basic information on how things should be handled safely until people with the experience and the authority arrive on scene. We provide uh, a menu of different trainings that will be uh, uh, advantageous or useful for our emergency response. Uh, we also have a section on recovery and salvage. Then we have a section on fact sheets, which we'll talk a little more about. We have uh, floor plans, uh, information about things in the museum that can be used in an emergency situation. And we also keep a list of off-site resources, which means our contractors, the building architects, uh, engineering firms that we use, all of our vendors, so that we can maintain uh, those links with people uh, during and after an emergency situation. We have an, an emergency response organization chart, which uh, is a little different than our standard staff emergency chart. Uh, here you'll have people higher up in the chart who are actually going to be hands-on to an emergency response. Uh, after your chief administrator, you can have your engineering department, your emergency plan coordinator, your security department, health and safety, and on down the line. And uh, things like finance and your IT people are also going to be involved in your response, but they might be a little lower down the chart because they're not the people that are going to know how to respond to an actual emergency while it's happening, in most cases. Also in, in our plan, we have what we call an action checklist, and this is just a, a sample of a page uh, for what uh, the responsibilities of this position would be. This is the uh, director of facilities position. And it has a line of succession for who uh, information is going to be handed down to. And it's just a basic checklist of what uh, the person in that position would need to do in an emergency situation. So again, this can be used by anybody in, in the museum who happens to be available until they're relieved by somebody with more responsibility. As far as fact sheets, we include things like floor plans. Uh, you want to have a floor plan that clearly shows the locations of all of your utility shutoffs, your firefighting equipment, hazardous material storage locations, even your storm drains, and where you have your first aid kits located. Uh, these plans can be shared with your local emergency responders, the fire department, the, the police department. It helps them know what we have in the building and where it's located, so that basically expedites their response. Another uh, example of what you want in your fact sheets, perhaps, is a, 
map of where your utility controls are so that you know where all of your utility shutoffs are located. And I know this has been discussed in, in previous uh, webinars, but the emergency response and salvage wheel, which can now be downloaded as a free app, uh, is, is a great tool. And it's something we encourage all of our staff to have on their, on their cell phones so that presented with an emergency situation, they can at least do a minimum of uh, salvage work for us. We also have what we call crash cards, and, and these are emergency response kits for the artwork. And uh, in these kits, uh, we keep different materials. We have uh, nitrile gloves, uh, cotton cleaning cloths, uh, N95 dust mask, duct tape, blue painter's tape, caution tape, uh, sponges, polyethylene sheeting. Uh, the list goes on and on. We have absorbent uh, socks, anything that might be used uh, in, in, in an art response situation. And then these uh, cards are located in strategic places throughout both of our museums. And also, another fact sheet you might want to think about is uh, if you use radios in your, in your institution, there should be certain protocols that everybody is on board with. Uh, you want to have an established emergency channel because most radio systems have an array of channels, but you want everybody to get to the same channel in an emergency. So you can say, Channel one is our emergency response channel. Everybody can dial in channel one via the same, same uh, channel. Uh, you always want to avoid, avoid unnecessary radio transmissions. Uh, when you're in the, in the middle of an emergency situation or an evacuation, the, the, the amount of chatter can really have an impact on how, communicate, how communications are going and what kind of information is being put out. So you want to avoid any unnecessary uh, chatter. If you know, somebody leaves their purse behind in the gallery, that's really not important at that time. So that you would refrain from uh, contributing that kind of information. And you should always identify yourself on a radio transmission because your voice, you might assume that everybody recognizes your voice, but it's going to sound different over a radio. So it's good protocol to identify yourself. And something that uh, has uh, become pretty standard after 9-11 uh, incidents was the uh, avoidance of 10 codes, you know, 10-4, 10 10 7 means uh, I'm on break. Uh, we hear that one a lot. Uh, 10 4 means yes, okay. Well, if you, you eliminate the 10 codes and speak plainly and clearly, that way all contributing emergency responding units are on the same page because not all 10 codes are set up the same. So, so that's sort of been eliminated and you just use plain speaking now. So 10 codes are no longer used in emergency situations. And you should always do a radio check when you sign it out in the morning so that you know your radio is actually in properly working order. And uh, you also should try and uh, set up a staff emergency information line. And this uh, really helps staff uh, to stay abreast of developing incidents. Uh, it can make, mean the difference between coming into work or staying home uh, in, in an emergency situation. So we use this uh, to communicate with all of our staff uh, you can also use a, uh, you know, an internet system, uh, web page, uh, Twitter account, anything to get the message out to your staff. Because if you don't want people coming to work, and if there, if certain people would actually be a hindrance based on the, the, the department they work for, you're better off to have them outside of the building. Another good idea is to get to know your local fire fighters and first responders. Uh, you can host an informational social event where they can learn about your collections and their value to the community. Uh, the more familiar they are with your collections and what they represent, uh, the better job they're going to be able to do of responding to an emergency in your facility without creating extra damage uh, to your collections. And as far as off-site resources, uh, you want to create a, a resource list that might include all of your vendors and service providers, as well as emergency agent agencies on the federal, state, and city level. Uh, and with your vendors, if you can arrange an exclusive service or priority service contract agreement, uh, that's really highly recommended, uh, so for, especially for uh, conservation work, if you use somebody like Belfour or one, one of the restoration services, if you have a uh, exclusive agreement with them, it could help you get equipment much faster uh, than, than you might ordinarily. 
because if if a disaster is regional in scope, equipment like freezer trucks and things like that are going to be a little harder to get. So for some extra money, you can actually uh, enter into an agreement with, with restoration companies or priority service. Once you do all that, uh, hopefully the, the, the goal is to create a coordinated response where everything uh, meshes and works as a fine-tuned machine. That's the objective. And as far as training goes, you can, uh, by training, you, you eliminate a lot of uh, doubt and uh, questions while you're actually responding to an emergency. So obviously you want to always uh, encourage fire drills. You should have at least two per year. Uh, if you have a building that's over 75 feet tall, it's considered a high rise. So you might consider high rise fire safety training. Portable fire extinguisher use training is always very helpful. Uh, how you respond to a power outage. Earthquake safety is very big for us here in California. You should constantly drill on your emergency evacuation procedures because people do forget uh, where they're supposed to go and what they're supposed to do. Uh, you want to eliminate that kind of debate. And another thing is CPR and uh, AED and first aid training is also very important for uh, response. And again, your art handling procedures should be something that you can train all of your staff on, your custodial staff, your security staff, uh, your admissions people, because they all might be called upon to respond to an emergency where we have to protect our collections. So here we have uh, uh, the acronym PASS, which uh, if you've never used a fire extinguisher before, knowing this acronym will actually help you use it. Uh, so PASS stands for pull, aim, squeeze, and sweep. And what you want to do here is pull the pin uh, that is uh, like a, a cotter pin type device in the handle of the fire extinguisher. You aim the nozzle at the base of the fire, you squeeze handle, trigger, and then you sweep the uh, nozzle at the base of the fire, past the fire as well. You always want to attack fire with fire extinguisher from the base of the fire. You never want to uh, attack a fire from the top of the fire because it will push the flames out at you uh, in certain situations. Last thing you need to do is, is to get yourself caught on fire when you're trying to respond to a small emergency. And remember that fire extinguishers really are designed for fires limited to the size of a uh, waste paper basket, perhaps. So you have to, you have to, this kind of training is good because it helps people understand where, where a fire extinguisher is actually practical to try and use, as opposed to uh, evacuate the building and call the fire. One of the best things you can do for yourself and your family and your coworkers is to be certified in CPR and AED first aid training. Uh, AED is uh, the defibrillators. Uh, most organ most institutions now have AEDs on site, but we we have a number of them and we've actually used them effectively uh, a number of times in the last few years. Uh, but if if you know CPR uh, in a high stress situation. People may have uh, medical emergencies. It'll help you to actually help them. And uh, it's just uh, gives you a level of confidence that is, is actually kind of surprising. But in any emergency, uh, remember that uh, you need to call 911 immediately before any other response because you want to get uh, first responders rolling as soon as possible because every minute saves lives and saves time. We'll talk a little bit about Good Samaritan laws because when you talk about um, CPR, a lot of people are very uncomfortable with it because uh, they're not sure what their liabilities are going to be. And basically, there are Good Samaritan laws that cover people who actually offer assistance or render aid in a medical emergency situation. There are some things to remember, that, for instance, you need to receive permission from the injured party or the ill party before you can even touch them. Uh, if they cannot uh, give you permission and if they do not have a companion with them who can grant permission, it's assumed that you would want someone to render assistance to you. So that's what you're going to do. And you're going to render assistance to the best of your ability uh, or at least what you're trained to do. And, and you're protected from any kind of uh, legal lawsuits that might, might arise from this. 
So if you actually, if, if your assistance actually ends up uh, injuring somebody more extensively, if you tried in all uh, consciousness to assist them, you are protected by law. The, the, the Good Samaritan laws are similar, but there are some differences state by state. So you can always check with the state you live in for what the Good Samaritan laws actually cover. The, one of the important things to remember is that if you do render assistance, you need to continue until you are relieved by someone else or a medical uh, responder. You can't walk away from the situation. So unless you are physically unable to continue, if you are exhausted, that's excusable. But if you are, if you abandon the person that you're rendering aid to, all of the Good Samaritan laws go out the window and uh, you will be liable for a lawsuit. Okay, we'll talk about protect, personal protective equipment, or PPE. You can see these are old WPA posters that were done during uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's administration back in the uh, early 30s. So the concept of personal protective equipment has been around for quite some time. Uh, the first thing you need to do is a hazard assessment to determine what kind of risk and exposures you're going to be uh, exposed to. Uh, that will determine what type of personal protective equipment you're going to need. As you can see in a situation like this, you're going to need quite a bit of personal protective equipment. Uh, here's a man working on that building. There are basically five categories of personal protective equipment. You have uh, foot protection, hand protection, eye protection, head protection, and body protection. Uh, and respiratory protection as well. Uh, here is where it gets a little tricky. Uh, most, a lot of people wear respirators without medical certification. So that is, uh, can be really harmful to your health. If you have an unknown condition, or even a known condition, if you have a respiratory condition or a heart ailment, uh, using a respirator puts a lot of stress on your system uh, more than, than usual. So you can actually you know, expedite a medical, a medical emergency for yourself. So you need to get medical clearance to wear a respirator. You have to make sure that it's fit tested, that it fits properly. You have to have a, if you have a, a respiratory protection program, you have to have a written program as well. That's required by OSHA. And uh, you can get all of that information from OSHA's website and by looking at the standard. So basically what you have to have in your respiratory protection program is the written plan, medical clearance, training on how to doff, don, and use the equipment, the respirator. You have to have a fit test done, and you have to have all of this uh, in your records. You have to keep records on, on all, all aspects of your respiratory protection program. And the best uh, advice I can give you about respirators is don't use them if you don't have to. If you've got any kind of uh, mechanical ventilation systems, if you have fume hoods, uh, elephant trunks, uh, good mechanical ventilations in your buildings, there's a possibility you don't actually even need a respirator. So it's good to have an industrial hygienist do a baseline survey for you uh, based on what kind of chemicals or products you're going to be using and what kind of ventilation systems you have in your buildings. Talk about hand protection. Uh, this is a photo. This is actually from the... Uh, Conservation Recovery Center uh, in Brooklyn that was set up by the FAIC after Hurricane Sandy. All right, you have hand protection basically means the different types of gloves that uh, you're going to wear. And uh, there is a whole range of gloves that are designed for different types of protections. Uh, industrial work like this or lifting crates, you want to use something fairly heavy. Uh, you might have to have gloves that are puncture proof that are chemical resistant. Uh, all of that information can be found online. Most, most of your vendors will have this information. Uh, there are charts available that tell you what type of uh, hand protection is required for the type of work you're going to be doing. So it's, it's good to know that not all gloves are created equal and uh, they, many of them are designed for very specific uses. Uh, these are the things that are covered in the standard. Uh, this is the and ANSI, ISEA. ANSI is the American National Standards Institute, and the ISEA is the International Safety Equipment Association. OSHA does not design equipment, or they, they don't even design the, uh, the requirements. 
they, they basically, well, I'm sorry, they do re design the requirements, but other manufacturers and other organizations are trusted to make sure that the standard is upheld but with the actual product. So what you need to look for in your uh, hand protection and gloves is uh, you need mechanical protection or chemical protection, chemical degradation, heat and flame protection, abrasion resistance, cold protection, and on down the line. And all of these things are rated and, and the information is available for any glove that you purchase. Hand protection is another type of uh, personal protective equipment that's very important. And uh, there are two standards that govern uh, head protection. And when we talk about head protection, essentially we're talking about hard hats. And hard hats are rated for uh, their uh, shock absorbency. Uh, they're rated for the, uh, they're conductive or non-conductive with electricity. Uh, so again, when you, not all hard hats are created equal. And here are the standards that govern hard hats. And this information, the name of the manufacturer, uh, what, it, what the standard, what the hard hat conforms with, and what class designation it has, and the class G, E, or C are uh, basically, uh, that relates to the uh, conductivity of the, of the helmet itself. And the size range for fitting and the date it was manufactured, all of that information will be found inside of the helmet. Uh, this highlight, highlighted section or the circle section. That is all the information that you need to know about the type of helmet you're wearing, and what it's rated, what use it's rated for. That helmet, by the way, is standard equipment uh, for uh, FAIC, National Heritage Responders uh, Group. Foot protection is another concern, and this is something um, I always talk to our conservators about is that you know once you get into a building if the building's been red tagged and you're finally allowed in after a disaster um, there's going to be in most cases there's going to be debris there's going to be broken glass there might be uh, you know, lots of physical hazards that would involve your feet so you want to make sure that you're wearing proper footwear and uh, again the standard for footwear is uh, found in, in OSHA's section 1910.136, and uh, footwear is rated for different a different type of uh, uh, uses. It's not all the same. For instance, uh, I'll show you the circle there. The line, the circle section is a tag which you'll find inside of the shoe, and that tells you what the shoe is, is rated for and what it can be used for. So well, let's go line by line here. Line one tells you that it does comply with the standard, which is uh, the ASTM F2413. And, and that standard is fairly new since about 2011. Uh, line two tells you that uh, the M stands for male, or if it's an F, it's uh, female for the user. It also identifies the existence of impact resistance, uh, the impact resistance rating, which is 75 foot-pounds for this shoe, is compression resistance, which is represented by the letter C, and the compression resistance rating, which is uh, represented by the number 75. And that correlates to 2,500 pounds of compression. And the metatarsal designation M and the rating uh, is also identified as 75 foot-pounds. So again, when, you, when you're selecting a work boot, this is what you're looking for. There are additional information that we don't see on this tag because certain shoes are rated for uh, different types of electrostatic protection, uh, uh, electric, electrical non-conductivity. So you, should, you, you need to look at the tag before you buy a pair of work boots. And of course, they should always be steel toe. And hearing protection is uh, also uh, another element of PPE. And like most of these program, most of these written programs we're, we're talking about uh, require a written program. So same thing with the hearing protection program. You need to have a written program that c covers the uh, purpose of the program, what your policy about uh, hearing protection is, the scope of the requirements, the summary of the regulatory requirements, uh, designated responsibilities for running the program. Uh, you have to have a system for monitoring employee noise, noise exposures. For instance, you should probably have an industrial hygienist come in and do a baseline uh, of uh, what your decibel levels are like in your building. Uh, in an emergency situation, that can change drastically. Uh, 
Uh, you need to have a section that talks about how you control noise exposures. Uh, again, you have to have audiometric testing done before you can wear protective equipment. Again, they'll do a baseline of what your hearing uh, capabilities are and monitor that on a yearly basis. You have to provide training in how to wear protective uh, ear equipment, and you have to maintain records as well. So again, most of the uh, uh, hearing protection standard uh, covers uh, these, these uh, elements. It, they monitor for continuous intermittent or impulse noises. Uh, they they want to know what the permissible exposure levels are uh, based on the work you're doing and, and the decibel level involved. And all of that's factored into what's known as a TWA, which is a time-weighted average. So you can determine what type of protection you need over a period of time. If you're working in loud noise area for four hours or eight hours, all of that is factored into the type of protection that you will select. And eye protection is very much the same thing. Uh, there are different types of uh, goggles and glasses that are available. Depending on the work you're doing, you might want something that is, uh, does not include side vents. Uh, if you're working with chemicals and liquids, side vents uh, are an, an entry for splashes, so you, you lose the splash protection. So again, uh, they're rated for uh, the use as well as the type of impacts that uh, uh, they're designed for. So you, you very carefully at packaging or at catalogs before you uh, select eye protection. And some of the things that uh, eye protection is rated for are, it's, again, chemical resistance, its impact or non-impact, and the optical radiation protection. That's something that would factor in if you're doing welding uh, or working in bright light sources, high, high heat sources. Uh, that would be something you look for in your eye protection. So now that we've gone through all of that, uh, here we see uh, protective clothing. And this man's wearing a Tyvek suit, which is pretty standard protection. Uh, regardless of what you're working with, chemicals, dust, molds, uh, construction work, you'll be wearing uh, protective clothing. Again, a Tyvek uh, suit is pretty, pretty versatile and pretty durable. And uh, if you're wondering, if the, I was going to ask you if you see anything wrong with this picture. Uh, and since I don't see a show of hands, I'll tell you that no, there's nothing wrong with this picture. This man is wearing all of the personal protective equipment that you can possibly want including fall protection. He's got his own individual fall protection harness on as well. Okay, we'll talk about risk and exposures. Uh, what happens when uh, different scenarios with flooding and water damage is something that uh, can result. The flooding can be the result of hurricanes, tropical storms, excessive rain, earthquakes, and rapidly melting snowpack. In most disasters you have, water is going to factor in in some way. It doesn't matter if it's a fire, an earthquake, a flood, there will be water present. Uh, water damage can create significant hazard, electrical hazards, uh, sit in, leave behind silt deposits, mud and debris, and toxic stew of raw sewage, fuel, and chemicals. Uh, so you have to be aware of all that. Once the water recedes, as, as some of you probably know very well right now, uh, that's when the real heartache and misery begins sometimes because you see what's left behind and it's never clean when, when water recedes, there, it's going to be a mess. You have to worry about things like, uh, in terms of responding, you have to worry about flat tires because there's going to be glass and nails and sharp objects everywhere on roadways and people's driveways. Uh, you have to worry about red tag buildings that you're not going to have access to for days or weeks or even months sometimes. And uh, then what the mud choked uh, heating equipment, uh, is, it just goes on and on. If you've ever experienced a flood in its aftermath, you're very familiar with this. But uh, I know there are people who are under the impression that water just goes away and things dry out. But I think as conservators, you know a lot better than that. So one of the things with water damage, uh, obviously, is uh, mold. And uh, there's always the risk of mold developing on paper, carpeting, furniture, wood, and sheetrock. And uh, they can be caused, mold outbreaks are usually caused by high humidity and water damage. Mold quickly can cause irreversible damage to paper and library collections. Many types of mold are a documented hazard to human health as well. and should be handled by trained professionals with personal protective equipment. And uh, the nature of mold is, uh, you know, there are over 100,000 species of fungi. So mold spores are present everywhere in our environment, and they're generally in a dormant state 
where they don't do any damage at all. Uh, but they do require moisture to become active. Uh, they do not require light to become active. They require moisture. So when you have water or high relative humidity, uh, that provides the necessary moisture and the dormant spores will germinate, They'll grow, like find web-like structures and eventually produce what they call what's known as fruiting bodies that release more spores. spores. Most molds will germinate at 65% relative humidity and that increases in temperature can speed the growth of, of mold even more. So uh, you need to be able to identify a mold and the uh, mold blooms come in many colors and is often confused with dust or dirt or foxing or cobwebs. And both active and inactive mold can have a distinctive smell, which most people will describe as a musty odor. Uh, active mold in its early stages uh, is, uh, it, it's, it's not a biohazard, but it, it can be accompanied by evidence of biological waste contaminations, like in a flood situation. Uh, when that happens, you need to be aware of it. And again, that's where personal protective equipment comes in very handy. And the information I'm giving you comes from the Harvard Library Preservation Services uh, in regards to mold. So some of the mold hazards uh, that you'll deal with are, uh, I think we just went through that, excuse me. So mold protection is uh, something you want to uh, be able to uh, be aware of. Uh, the key engineering controls and work practice for dealing with mold are that you should discard all water damaged materials, and any materials that are visibly coated with mold that cannot be properly cleaned, porous materials, carpeting, drywall, or insulation. Uh, anything that's been wet for more than 48 hours can be discarded. Of course, we're not talking about artwork and collections. Uh, those items like sheetrock and carpet should be wrapped and sealed and discarded in plastic bags or uh, you can use uh, polyethylene sheeting to create uh, containers for it. And they can generally be discarded as ordinary debris. You won't, if you're working in a mold situation, you want to minimize dust disturbances to reduce the spread of the fungal spores. Uh, never eat, drink, or smoke in work areas where mold is present. You want to be able to provide natural or local exhaust ventilation during all of the cleaning steps involved. Uh, you want to uh, well, I won't talk about how you handle mold as conservators because I think you already know that. And I know some of the uh, webinars have talked about these things. And as far as personal protective equipment, you know, if you're working with mold, you want to use at least a, a, an N or R or P95 rated respirator. Uh, either a half face or full face NR or P95 respirator for areas smaller than 100 square feet. For areas uh, greater than 100 square feet, or mold is heavy, like a blanket during cleaning of or, or debris removal, uh, you want to uh, use a full face respirator if at all possible. And uh, with a respirator, you want to make sure you have a charcoal impregnated filter combination filter so that uh, that will also remove some of the odors for you and be a little more comfortable to use. And uh, you should, all, again, use non-venting uh, goggles when you're working with mold. And protective clothing, again, you should wear disposable coveralls to prevent cross-contamination and skin contact with mold and other chemicals. And for areas greater than 100 square feet, you should ensure that protective clothing covers entire, your entire body, including your head and your feet. Uh, and long gloves made of material that will protect users from chemicals handled for surface cleaning should also be used. Okay, fire. Uh, fire produces a lot of problematic conditions for everybody. Um, you're going to pre fires obviously produce smoke, and smoke produces soot. So, just as smoke contains carbon monoxide and methane, uh, volatile or organic compounds, uh, formaldehyde, benzene, acetic acid, formic acid, toluene, organic carbon, and the list goes on and on. Um, that's what you're going to find in smoke and in soot. And smoke is actually the result of incomplete combustion. Uh, smoke releases carbon particulate into the air. Those are the particulates that are known as soot. And in the aftermath of a fire, soot will be deposited on surface within the fire damaged structure. So uh, as far as soot and soot removal goes, some of the hazards associated with soot are uh, respiratory and dermal exposure. 
uh, soot is an irritant to your lung and uh, tissue and, and to your skin. You can protect yourself by utilizing the following practices. So when you're working with, with a soot abatement, again, do not eat, drink, or smoke in a soot contaminated area or around soot damaged materials. You should wear an air purifying respirator with appropriate filter cartridges. The best cartridge for using uh, with mold is known as a CBRN cartridge. That stands for chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear cartridge. You use a HEPA vacuum to remove soot residue and wear safety glasses and wear a pair of nitrile gloves and remove them really carefully. Remove them like nurses remove gloves or a doctor removes gloves after an examination so that your skin is not coming in contact with the exterior surface of the glove at any time. And uh, keep your hands away from your... Uh, oops, sorry about that. Uh, I apologize. Uh, wear a pair of nitrile gloves and when you remove them, you still keep your uh, hands away from your face, your mouth, and your eyes so that you eliminate those as exposure routes. And practice good hygiene at all times. Whenever you're done working, you want to wash your hands thoroughly using soap and warm water. And uh, that will help protect you from many of the uh, health hazards associated with mold. Okay, uh, talk about chemical spills and releases. This is something that also occurs quite often in the aftermath of a, of a disaster. And uh, I doubt if most of us are working with chemicals on the scale here, like uh, 50 gallon drums. But we do have small amounts of chemicals in most of our laboratories. And uh, in the photo here, you see some uh, chemicals and things that are labeled entirely incorrectly. Uh, there's no way to really know what are in these bottles. Uh, the, uh, if you, write, if you write down a chemical name on a piece of masking tape and apply it to the bottle, it's going to fade and eventually the person who the poor person who has to handle these things and dispose of them isn't really going to know what's inside the bottles. Uh, so there's something called the Global Harmonization Standard that the United States of America has finally signed on to. I think we were the last country to do so. It's an international agreement for how chemicals are labeled and how uh, information about chemicals is disseminated. So this is what container labeling requirements used to look like. Uh, where you, you had a basic uh, manufacturer's name, a personal protective equipment was needed around to wear around these chemicals, and what the chemical itself was. But the new standard uh, includes a lot more information. Actually, it's a lot more concise information. And, and what you have here are there are six required uh, elements for uh, chemical labels now. Uh, number one is the product identifier. It tells you what the chemical is. Number two is a signal word. Was, there are two signal words, danger and uh, caution. And uh, that tells you the, you know, the, this, the, the degree of, of uh, danger uh, that this chemical can, uh, can create for you. Number three is the use of pictograms to dis describe uh, uh, the what what the uh, chemical is actually capable of. So you have here you have a pictogram for uh, uh, severe toxicity, uh, flammability. Uh, the the right hand side is uh, health uh, ser serious health issues, and uh, the uh, icon with the hand is uh, corrosiveness. So those are uh, you know good vis vis visual guidelines for you to know what's involved with using that chemical. Uh, there are training requirements that come with the global harmonization system. Uh, you have to train people on the elements of the new label. Uh, material safety data sheets are now called safety data sheets, and they're in a uniform 16-part format. So that they're much easier to read now. They're, it's a uniform system used throughout, throughout the world, and uh, all of the organization has to be listed in the same chronology. And you also, anytime you bring in a new chemical, into your facility, you have to identify that, what the physical and health hazards are, and you also have to train your staff uh, when you uh, bring in an initial uh, new chemical, you have to train them how to use it for their initial assignment, and, and also whenever a new chemical is brought into the building, you have to uh, make sure that everyone's aware of what that is. 
you also need to have a written hazard communication program known as a HAZCOM program. Uh, that's an OSHA requirement as well. And uh, it requires chem uh, employees who use chemicals or hazardous materials to create an inventory of all of your hazardous materials used in the workplace, uh, ensure that labeling is done properly. You have to have a uh, database of your safety data sheets, and you have to keep them filed for reference. Uh, that should be done. You should have a central location for your data sheets, as well as each area where the chemicals are being used should have uh, a, a safety data, uh, an R a right to know station. RTK stands for right to know so that you have quick and ready access to the information sheets if you have a chemical spill. And again, you need to have a written hazard communication program. Okay, the, some of the immediate hazards uh, during, uh, during and after a disaster are things like uh, glass. Uh, for instance, you should know where you have large glass areas in your facilities. This is a uh, skylight uh, at our Legion of Honor facility. Because in, in the event of an emergency, uh, hurricanes, earthquakes, there's a very good possibility that glass is going to be broken, and then it becomes a hazard. So with glass, some of the hazards are you know, lacerations, uh, cuts, uh, infections. So again, you, this is where personal protective equipment comes in handy. This is where you want to know what you're going to need to uh, work with, with the kind of damage that you're, you're confronted with. And uh, something I'd like to add is that with broken glass, uh, it needs to be cleaned up. Uh, it's a good idea to invest in non-sparking tools, if at all possible. Uh, that includes shovels, uh, wrenches, pliers. Uh, they're fairly expensive, but they do not spark. And the, the value of that is uh, if you have a gas leak that's happening simultaneously with the rest of all the other issues you might be dealing with in a disaster, uh, at least the spark, the non-sparking tools will not... Uh, spark, uh, create a, a natural gas explosion. So uh, non-sparking tools are definitely something to consider. Another uh, risk and exposure is uh, falling objects during an earthquake or in a big storm. Uh, things can fall, so uh, it's always a good idea to have all of your uh, materials stored and secured, uh, strapped to uh, you know, secure uh, walls, or, uh, storage systems, and uh, same thing with uh, shelving units. You can uh, strap uh, containers into your shelving units. I prefer this type of strapping over bungee cords. Bungee cords have a tendency to fail and uh, they become a real eye hazard. Uh, so at the risk of uh, losing an eye, I think you're much better off with uh, strapping with buckles and, and nylon, nylon straps. Uh, bungee cords will work and they are effective up until the day they break. And you should always uh, put all of your, store your heavier objects on lower shelves and uh, lighter objects on higher shelves. And that's something out in earthquake country, we preach that all the time. Having a, 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 a map that shows where your utility shutoff locations are is very important uh, during and after an, an emergency. You wanna know where the locations are for shutting off your water, your gas, and your electricity. Having a, a, a site plan which shows where your exterior shutoffs are on the perimeter of your building uh, also is a huge help. And all of this information can be forwarded to your local emergency responders and your fire department. If you are required by your municipality to have a hazard communication plan, all of this information goes on their, their hazard uh, communication, their hazard response truck. So they have this information available as they're actually rolling to your location. So, so there's, and, and I think this adds another layer, layer of protection to your uh, collections policies and how you protect your policies. I think uh, occupational health and safety in, in, a, in a cultural institution does provide another layer of safety for your collections. Uh, after an emergency or a disaster, you want to be able to inspect your utilities. So therefore, if you know where they are because you have a map, uh, you can inspect them for uh, uh, leaks or broke, broken water pipes. And uh, when you do that, you can, uh, with a gas leak, for instance, you will hear it uh, and you will smell it because natural gas uh, has an odor added to it. But usually a gas leak, you will hear a hissing sound or a whooshing sound uh, coming from the pipe because it's under such high pressure. And if it sprung a leak, you're going to hear that. Uh, 
you need to inspect your utilities. And this diagram shows you how a, a, a standard a gas line can be shut off uh, when the pipe is uh, uh, in a vertical position. When the valve is in a vertical position, it means that the uh, gas line is on. And when it's in a horizontal position, basically when it, when it goes across the pipe, you have you know that you've shut the gas off, so you can be certain that, that you've done it properly. Uh, you want to label all of your pipes throughout your building. Your domestic this is a domestic cold water line. Your sewage lines uh, they should be labeled. So again, emergency responders have an easier time finding them. Uh, your building engineers can uh, perform uh, emergency shutdown work quicker uh, because it's so much easier to identify what those lines do and where they go. And you have to worry about electrical hazards anytime you have a, a, a disaster, an earthquake, floods, particularly floods, because just wet, even generally just lightly damp, wet floors can, can conduct electricity. So you would inspect all of your areas for electrical hazards, uh, something to be very careful about. Uh, wading through floodwaters is never a good idea because uh, you can be exposing yourself to uh, a, a live wire that's actually being conducted through the water. And not all electrical hazards will be as obvious as this one. Uh, believe it or not, this light switch actually works. Uh, but uh, you need to be aware of electrical hazards as well. And the last thing I want to talk about is something that hadn't occurred to me really as part of emergency response until uh, watching the news and reading about uh, the uh, hurricanes in Texas and Florida. And I realized, you know, you're in warmer climates, in most areas, you're not going to be doing your... Uh, salvage work and, and conservation work inside the building that's been damaged, you're more than likely going to be outside. And if you're in a, a high heat area, you need to worry about uh, heat illnesses uh, and disorders that are related to heat, heat, on, heat illnesses. So I'd like to finish up by talking about that a little bit. We'll start with uh, the most minor of uh, uh, heat disorders, uh, barring a, you know, a sunburn which is heat cramps. Uh, this will be one of the first things that happens to you if you are dehydrated and if you're being exposed to too much heat and sun. Uh, and you can see what the symptoms are and what the first aid treatment is as well. I don't think I have time to go through them point by point, but it's pretty obvious first aid. And all of this information can be found at uh, on, on the American Red Cross website. Uh, you know, if you have a safety department in your institution, they should be able to provide this information. And OSHA does have a heat illness prevention program now, which is not only designed to, most people assume it's designed for uh, uh, agricultural workers, but it's not. And it includes anybody who works outdoors for any, even a short period of time. You have to provide them with adequate protections from heat illnesses. So again, if you're doing uh, salvage work outside, there are certain things you want to uh, be aware of. Uh, the next stage of a heat illness would be heat exhaustion. This is a little more serious than heat cramps. You see what the symptoms and first aid are for that. And uh, the most serious is heat stroke. When, uh, when this sets in, it's a life-threatening condition. So uh, it, you will notice that someone is confused. They might faint. Uh, excessive sweating or red, hot, dry skin are indicators that someone might be uh, experiencing heat stroke. And first aid for this is you definitely need to call 911 immediately because this is a life-threatening condition. Uh, you want to remove that worker and get them into a shady area, loosen their clothing and outer clothing, keep them cool and wet. Uh, do not administer fluids at this point because if they're going to need emergency medical treatment, uh, having fluids in your system can delay the, the treatment uh, that you're about you're going to receive. And you want to stay with that worker until help arrives. Uh, never leave somebody alone who's in this condition. So the way to pre prevent this, and this, this goes for re anybody, this is the, even on your uh, free time when you're out at an outdoor concert, uh, any kind of an event, the way to prevent heat illnesses is, is uh, by staying hydrated, uh, make sure you have ac access to shade, even if that's a sun hat, uh, you want to have some shade. And then there's uh, the concept of acclimatization. Uh, workers can acclimatize themselves to working in heat conditions a little at a time. So it's important to uh, not send somebody out for an eight-hour shift that hasn't worked out outdoors at all because they're not going to have enough time to acclimatize to that intense heat. And, and when we talk about heat, 
Most of these uh, standards for heat illness prevention kick in at the temperature of 85 degrees or higher. Uh, and then you have high heat standards that kick in at 95 degrees. And the most important way to avoid uh, heat illness injuries for people or illnesses is uh, through training, employee training. And, and again, uh, we have a heat illness uh, training program. I'm happy to share that with any of you if, if you think that's something you're interested in. And I can be reached at uh, the email address that you see here. And I'm happy to share any resources or information that I have with all of you. And uh, that concludes my presentation for today. And I'd like to thank you for staying with me and all your time and attention. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Thank you so much, Al. Um, we have oh, just a couple of moments. If anyone has any questions for Al, um, it's very generous of you to provide your email address there if there are follow-ups. But obviously, this is a very important topic. Uh, I see Bethany uh, wrote in to say that heat was a, a huge issue for them, um, and I'm assuming that was in the Irma response. So thank you for addressing that important point here. Um, did anyone have any questions? I know um, we're running later than expected, and that uh, is my fault. I apologize for the technical issues at the start of the program. Thank you for uh, your perseverance to everyone who attended, and um, thank you, Al, for your patience as well. Uh, I'm not seeing anyone. I'm not seeing anyone typing, um, but I know we are going to be discussing this topic a lot more uh, during our in-person training next week. So perhaps uh, during that conversation, we might come up with some some more questions to discuss as a group. Um, so with that, I will just say thank you so much to Al for putting together this really wonderful presentation for our group. Um, I, I know it was, like I said, a very important topic for everyone, but also uh, very engaging as well. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined in the session today. I will be emailing you all with a, a couple of messages about um, the upcoming components of our training. But um, again, thanks to everyone, and I will be in touch soon.